And of course, I initially thought, well, that's absurd. I'm not buying a friggin' mobile home park. <laughs> and I would delete the search results, but I kept getting hit over the head uh, five times, 10 times, I don't know. But I then finally thought, you know, well, these things do seem to be multifamily. They seem to be stable, like apartments. Why don't I look into it? Um, so I did. And then I discovered it's really a, a superior multifamily asset class superior to apartments. So it was part, you know, plan and part dumb luck, I guess you could say. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority. And today I have got a special guest that has raised Buku's. And yes, even if you're not from Eastern North Carolina, you know how much Buku's million dollars uh, when I say he's raised a lot of money, private money, for the special niche that he's in of mobile home parks. He is one of America's largest mobile home park owners and operators. He's acquired 43 mobile home parks across 15 states, got a value of $81 million. Now, my guest has been featured in Bloomberg Magazine, the New York Times, and the Real Money TV show. Started the world's first mobile home park investing podcast, and it's had over 15,000 downloads per month on a consistent basis. In addition to that, my special guest founded the world's largest mobile home park investing and networking group. On LinkedIn, 6,800 plus members. I'm so excited to have my guest. He's a mobile home park investment expert and an educator as well. In just a moment after this, you're gonna be meeting my special guest, Mr. Jefferson Lilly. Before I bring on my special guest, Jefferson, that I was just telling you about, I've got a special announcement and I want you, we're live streaming here. We got the podcast going on, but in less than or right at two weeks from now, here's the special announcement. I'm going to be live in person at our live event right here in Eastern North Carolina, Moorhead City, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. And this is the Private Money Academy Conference, live camp conference. The dates are Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. That's October 25, 26, and 27, right here in Eastern North Carolina. And look, why would you want to come? Well, uh, during these three days, it's going to be focused a lot on private money, how to get private money for your real estate deals, single family houses, multifamily, et cetera. I'm going to have private lenders at the event for you to network with. I'm going to be there all three days. And we're not just going to be focusing on private money, but in addition to that, I'm going to be teaching my all four pillars of our real estate investing business, how we find deals before other real estate investors even know about them existing. Um, so finding deals, how to get them funded with private money, how to do rehabs. If you're interested in that, we're going to do a virtual tour one afternoon. In addition to that, how are you able to sell the properties so quickly, so fast? How to sell any house in three days or less? And then Friday is all about automation. Automation. How do you run this business, this multi-million dollar business, in less than 10 hours per week? And again, you're going to be networking with private lenders. It's going to be an amazing event. And here's the best part. In addition to this amazing event, it's a free event with only a $97 registration fee. Here's how you get enrolled and registered. Go to www.jaysliveevent.com. That's all spelled out. J-A-Y-S-L-I-V-E. Eventcom, jaysliveevent.com to get registered. You don't want to miss out on this private money event, October 25, 26, and 27. It's at a beautiful oceanfront, oceanfront hotel, resort, 
Beautiful time of year. Don't miss out. I look forward to meeting you in person at the live event, jaysliveevent.com. With that, as I said a moment ago, I'm so excited to have my guest come on. And here's what's really cool. Jefferson, he is like one of the largest mobile home park operators. And guess what? My dad, Wallace Connor, was the largest retailer of mobile homes, manufactured homes, for quite a few years back in the uh, back in the late 80s. So we're going to have a great conversation. With that, let's bring Jefferson Lilly on right now. Jefferson, Hello. welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello, Jay. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. So thrilled, thrilled to be here with you today. Absolutely. Well, this show is called Raising Private Money. The reason I wanted to have you here on the show is not only to talk about the niche that you're in, which is a pretty interesting niche, um, but you have got a lot of experience in raising private money, uh, you know, for your deals, for your projects. And so Jefferson, we really have got two different audiences that are tuning in here to the show. One group or one segment of the audience are real estate investors that are looking to raise private money for their deals. So we're going to talk about that first. How did you go about starting raising private money? How do you, you know, what are your strategies? What are a few of your secrets on getting the money to chase you instead of you chasing the money? And then the other part of our audience are people that are interested in being passive real estate investors and they want to be a private lender. They want to invest in deals. And so we'll talk about your capital fund and all that kind of stuff. So first, let's start out. First, you got to tell us this. Why mobile homes and how did you get into it? Uh, well, you know, when, when I woke up from the concussion, Jay, it just seemed like a great idea to buy a mobile home park. <laughs> uh, uh, no, seriously. Uh, so I had um, spent most of my 30s uh, working at various different um, high tech uh, venture backed startup companies out here in Silicon Valley. That's how I ended up coming out here after business school uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area. And I saw, I went through the dot-com boom and bust uh, that, uh, you know, saw my stock option value go really high. And I felt I was a genius and then really low. And I felt like I was an idiot. And, you know, <laughs> I decided I wanted something a little more stable on, uh, for side income. And honestly, I initially thought I was going to buy an apartment building. Uh, and then just in searching for multifamily properties, uh, I'd see a lot of apartment buildings and maybe one in every hundred leads uh, was a mobile home park. This is a tiny niche. Maybe it's 1% of all the, the multifamily world. The other 99% of multifamily is apartment buildings. Anyway, I kept seeing these little you know mobile home parks that seem to be priced better than apartments. And of course, I initially thought, well, that's absurd. I'm not buying a friggin' mobile home park. <laughs> and I would delete the search results, but I kept getting hit over the head uh, five times, 10 times. I don't know. But I then finally thought, you know, well, these things do seem to be multifamily. They seem to be stable like apartments. Why don't I look into it? So um, so I did. And then I discovered it's really a, a superior multifamily asset class superior to apartments. So it was part, you know, plan and part dumb luck, I guess you could say, is is how I got into uh, mobile home parks. What year did you uh, get your first mobile home park? 2007. Okay. Off eBay. Yeah. eBay. March of 2007. Yes. I got you. Well, my dad uh, that I mentioned in the introduction, um, he actually started a mobile home park here in the local area in 1958, 1958. Great. And he was selling mobile homes next door to the, to his parents' grocery store way out in the country. So he got his start way back in the late fifties. And so, uh, I've never, I've never invested in a mobile home park myself, but I've got some good friends that have, and they love it. Uh, now I've heard, so comment on this, and then we're going to dig into, first of all, talking to real estate investors on how you go about raising private money. Um, but I've got some good friends that invest in it. And I've heard that a lot of these deals are able to be purchased with the 
uh, with the owner that is selling the park with seller financing, taking back a note and financing it for the buyer. Um, but I'm sure they want down payment and all that kind of stuff. So how does private money work with, um, with the mobile home business? I'm sure you got some sellers that won't take a, a, a second. I mean, won't take a seller carry back. They want all the cash. So there's no deal. Uh, or is it just all the above? You know, we finance deals a range of different ways uh, out of those roughly 43 parks. Three or four uh, have had seller carry. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously most of them have not. Uh, mm -hmm. We tend to get CMBS debt uh, put on them. That's the fancy Wall Street debt. Uh, we have borrowed uh, from banks on probably another five or so of those parks. So the bulk of it has been the, the longer term non-recourse CMBS debt. Uh, but, you know, frankly, Jay, I'll do anything for a buck and I try and be easy to sell to. Uh, and so there's certainly great tax advantages to a seller to doing seller carry. Now, to be candid, most sellers, you know, only have one mobile home park to sell. They're not experienced at selling a mobile home park. And they've just always thought, I just want cash, all cash. Just give me cash. I'm not taking back paper. Just give me all cash. Uh, that creates some tax headaches for sellers, but we try and be easy to sell to. If a seller says, I don't want to take back paper, just give me all cash, we will do that. If a seller says, hey, I get it, it's it's really tax advantaged for me to have an installment sale to sell you the property over time, uh, that then we're happy to do it that way and, and have seller carry. Um, frankly, for us, it's a mortgage either way, whether we owe the money to the seller, to Wall Street through the, the CMBS conduit lending, or whether we owe the money to a bank in that you know, from that perspective, we're largely indifferent. We're going to owe somebody some money. It's just a question of whether that's the seller or a bank or uh, or CMBS financing. Sure. Yeah, that's interesting uh, to hear your percentage there to where really only about 10 percent of yeah, the mobile 10. home parts uh, that you've invested in actually have a a, a seller is, is holding the note and, and is taking payments, which mm -hmm. leads me to my point that I make all the time. And that is, you know, out here in, in the world of single family houses, um, you know, I've got friends, I've got fellow educators that teach on how to buy on terms and that kind of thing. But yeah. what I've learned at the end of the day, after rehabbing over 500 houses and losing my line of credit at the bank back in 2009 and, and all that stuff, what I've learned is that in the real world, most transactions, most sellers are going to require all the cash. And when you've got the private money ready to go, you're just going to do a whole lot more deals. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's why I, I like to raise money in funds rather than deal by deal. So we've raised up uh, what is now my fourth fund. We're, we're still investing that capital, but we've got millions in the bank. And I think hopefully next Wednesday or Thursday, we're supposed to close our next property. It'll be for all cash. Uh, then later in the year, early next, as we find additional properties to buy, we'll come back to this property and several others that we have bought for all cash over the last year. And we'll lever them up and, and we'll do more deals. We'll borrow our equity out. But uh, I like to work typically on, uh, uh, you know, with, with the fund structure because then, yeah, I can close some of these deals in as little as 30 days, no financing contingency, all cash, let's get it done. It might not be at, you know, a price that the seller was initially asking, but my offer is also a lot lower risk. I can show in my bank account, have proof of funds. I've got a track record of closing quickly. Um, and that appeals to, to some sellers that, that might, uh, you know, sell for, for a bit less, uh, in exchange for having cash in 30 days. So you've got quite a few years experience in raising capital for real estate and here on raising private money, uh, podcast, we've got real estate investors that are raising money for single family houses. We got yep. investors that are raising money 
for uh, multifamily. Um, may have one or two raising money for mobile home parks. I don't know. So yeah. given your experience over the years, what are some lessons learned that as you were raising capital, you said, you know what? I shouldn't go about it that way anymore. I should do it a different way. So we're looking for advice for you to share on raising capital, what not to do, what to do. Yep. So I got my start uh, with my first deal. Uh, it was not a fund. I started off doing uh, a raising money deal by deal. Um, I had actually before, well, before I, that was my first deal with outside capital. Before doing that, however, I had purchased two mobile home parks uh, with a chunk of my own personal net worth no outside investors, uh, a bank involved on both the deals. Uh, but I had had it by that point, roughly a five year track record in the mobile home park business with my own capital. So that helped uh, establish a track record. So it was at that point, sorry. And then I was also posting online at various mobile home park forums and sharing advice and helping other people. Um, so I, you know, I'm not famous, but people in some people in the mobile home park business did know me. So, uh, when I then said, Hey, I've got my first deal. Uh, I reached out to some of those folks, uh, that I had uh, met online, um, and, and other folks that, that, that I knew from, uh, getting basically from beginning to research the business. Um, so I, I raised then, uh, this was my first deal was with a partner, uh, as several of those earlier deals were, uh, but we had relatively little difficulty raising. I, I believe that first deal was, uh, we needed about 450,000. I believe we were oversubscribed and we actually had 600,000, uh, over at the title company as we were going into closing. So, uh, so we did refund uh, some people part of their money. We decided to keep everybody in the deal, uh, make, uh, I guess, everybody a little bit unhappy that they, they got back maybe 25% of their capital. Uh, but frankly, Jay, that way we had more people in the deal rather than shutting out, you know, 25% of the people and letting the remaining 75 uh, have it all. Uh, anyway, so there were more people in the deal. We did well with that deal. We started paying out earnings uh, that first quarter. Uh, we've since exited that deal. The investors have done well, double-digit IRR. Um, so just in having in that first deal, then more people in that deal, that helped us then raise additional money for the next deal and a third deal, uh, all deal by deals. And then after doing three deal by deals and raising successively more money, uh, then uh, I graduated into the fund structure and raised my first fund. So uh, so it all builds on itself. You know, I started again real small, just buying my first park and helping people online and, and you know, really got started off in that way, just establishing credibility and a name for myself. But it was uh, several years before I raised capital uh, based off that that track record. Um, so if I've made a mistake and I've made plenty, uh, I would have gotten into this business sooner. I would have raised uh, outside capital sooner. Uh, but uh, so be it. I, you know, over the course of about five years, bought uh, two parks, also did some consulting to a couple high net worth families that had interests in mobile home parks um, and then went off. And, and started raising outside capital. So that's how I got my start. It all just snowballs and gets bigger and bigger. Sure. So how did you, on those first few deals, how did you start putting the word out that you had an opportunity for people to invest in? How did you share the information with them? How did you start conversations? So it was really just posting online in some mobile home park forums. Uh, I think we, knew also a couple of other folks, you know, that had just heard uh, uh, of my partner and me and what we were thinking of doing. Um, we also put up a website and right at the top of that website was uh, a, a link to join our mailing list. Mm -hmm. So that also helped us build our own mailing list 
uh, of, of, of people that were interested in what we were doing. So, you know, we had, I think, kind of the right uh, keywords on our website for mobile home park, fund, uh, passive investor, passive income. You know, we had some of the right words uh, on that website. And um, so, you know, we got picked up by Google. And so then before too long, when people were searching on mobile home park fund, our website would pop up on that first page of listings. And again, that further helped build the snowball. Uh, I've now got something over 5,300 people on that mailing list. Um, anyway, so uh, so that that's basically what we did to, to start getting the word out with some one-to-one -one solicitations. And, and already folks, even before we did our first deal, had also reached out and just said, hey, if you ever you know are raising money, you bought parks on your own, Jefferson. If you ever raise outside money, you know, let me let me know. I might want to kick in fifty grand or a hundred grand. And so I, I kept those names and numbers. <laughs> For sure. Well, one one big takeaway that I just heard you say was getting involved and being active in online forums, online networking groups. And of course, you've heard it said a thousand times, there's a direct correlation between your network and your net worth and how you grow yeah. that. So um, what I've discovered is getting involved in those types of online groups, real estate investing groups, go there to give first. Yes. Don't, don't go there to get, right? We want to lead with a servant's heart. And I also just heard you say um, a couple of minutes ago, you were going into these forums and you were giving advice. You were sharing yes. with what you're doing and what you got going on. And, um, you know, I have found that when you lead with a servant's heart and you lead with giving value, then you don't have to worry about it coming back around to you. Right. Yep. I, I would agree with that. Generally, uh, the, the money has come in faster than the deals. Yes. So uh, <laughs> that's my problem. I guess that's 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 a, a high class problem to have, <laughs> but probably better than the other way around. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Give give it giving first, uh, having that servant's heart and uh, really seeking to just help other, you know, other people, other folks, you know, had said, oh, I just bought a park. I've got a question about my utilities, finding water leaks or how do I market to tenants or what have you. Yeah, I mean, I spent years uh, answering other people's questions online. Yeah. One thing you said at the uh, at the um, start of the show was that, you know, you were dismissing all these mobile home park opportunities. Yep. That, that were showing up, but then you started digging into it. And then you discovered that this is an asset class that actually performs or can perform better than your traditional multifamily asset class. Yes. Why is that? And how is that? So most folks on uh, our, our call today are probably somewhat familiar with, with, you know, the idea of apartment building investing or single family house investing. You're buying an asset. If you buy it right with some leverage, you're likely to do well over the long run, you know, provided you manage it well. So all that that dynamic is also very much present with mobile home parks. But imagine now if somehow your apartment investing, uh, your apartment investment was one whereby the tenants actually took immaculate care of the apartment building and you almost never had to fix any leaky toilets or leaky roofs. And now imagine if your apartment building investment was largely protected from competition, if it was uh, illegal to build any new apartment buildings. So if you had an apartment building with no more competition than you already have today, and you have very low repair and maintenance costs, that would be a pretty awesome apartment building, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> so that's those two things principally are what make mobile home parks such a compelling investment. The tenants own most of the mobile homes which means the tenants take care of their own proverbial leaky toilets and leaky roofs. So we mostly just have repair and maintenance for the land. We do have mm -hmm. repair and maintenance, but it's about a third of what apartment buildings run. We spend about 6% 
of our revenues on repair and maintenance. My understanding, I've never owned an apartment building, but my understanding is that typical apartment repair and maintenance budgets are about uh, spending about 18% of rents, mm. about three times higher on repair and maintenance. We just maintain the land. We've got some sewer issues, water issues, lawn mowing, snow plowing for our parks up north. True. But again, we don't have uh, to maintain the improvements, those proverbial leaky toilets, leaky roofs, the windows, the locks, the carpeting, that's all owned by our tenants. So our repair and maintenance is low. Uh, and then secondly, it is, I use the term illegal, but it's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, it is very, very difficult to build any new mobile home parks. Uh, we've seen uh, municipalities like in Oklahoma, where I got my start, a little town called Slaughterville. <laughs> uh, they passed a resolution after I bought my park and started improving it, such that the density had to be 20 times lower on any future mobile home parks constructed. So normally you have 10 mobile homes per acre. So say if you had two acres of land, you would normally be able to put 20 mobile homes on two acres of land, divide the cost of two acres of land by 20. Well, this town passed a resolution that said you have to have two acres of land per mobile home. Hmm. So that increases the land costs by 20 times. That also means you have to run about 20 times more pavement between mobile homes that would be that far apart, 20 times more plumbing, 20 times more electric infrastructure. So they have, and then they also required that you put up a three, uh, sorry, a 12 foot high fence of bushes all the way around the mobile home park. So you can't even see the mobile home park. Mm. So they haven't made it illegal, but they've just made it not economic. Nobody would ever buy two acres of land per mobile home and then put up all that foliage to have a wall around your mobile home, uh, your mobile home park. So we see that sort of legislation taking various forms but most cities and counties have now made it effectively illegal to build a new mobile home park because they write these laws with very low zoning densities and such things. Um, so there will never be another mobile home park built in Slaughterville, Oklahoma. There'll never be another mobile home park built in most cities. But best guess is that over the last year, nationwide there have been maybe 10 mobile home parks constructed. Mm -hmm. So compare that. I don't know what the number is for apartment buildings, but you know there have probably been thousands of apartment buildings put up over the last year. So in this niche, because local governments have such a NIMBY, not in my backyard, mm -hmm. uh, uh, perspective on things, they've made it pretty much illegal to construct any more uh, mobile home parks. So that's why, you know, it's, it's difficult to find one of these. There aren't many and they aren't making new ones, but you know, if you can find a mobile home park to buy, again, you've got an asset with, uh, that's fairly stable. You'll have very low repair and maintenance, and you'll likely never have any new competition. Got you. Sort of, you're sort of like insulated. <laughs> yes. As Warren Buffett would say, you've got quite a moat uh, around your, your business. Yes. Right. Now, we have a number of uh, listeners here to the show, um, Jefferson, that love to be passive investors. They want to get yep. nice rates of return safely and securely. Uh, you've got a fund where people can participate in that. Uh, tell us about your fund and that uh, website URL. Sure. So we're at parkavenuepartners.com. And as I mentioned before, right at the top of the website is a button that says click here to join our mailing list. That'll be the easiest way to stay abreast of when we launch our next fund, which will be our fifth fund, 
that'll likely be coming in early early next year, first half of 2024. Um, we email out a little less than once a month. Uh, we don't. I don't really spam. Uh, I could probably be more savvy <laughs> with online marketing than I am. Uh, but anyway, you'll you'll hear a little bit about some of our upcoming deals as we buy them. Uh, and then again, you'd be notified of our next fund launch. So just click that join our mailing list button at parkavenuepartners.com. I believe then towards the bottom of that homepage, I think there's also an intake form. If you want to just type out a specific question or something, uh, you can do that. Um, and then there's also our phone number there. I believe it's 415-228-6900. You can also call off, off the website and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer questions. But again, most of the questions will be answered in a series of presentations uh, early next year when we launch our next fund. And That's then I also, do, I also do go around about the top 20, 24 cities in America and host dinners. And again, that's a chance to meet uh, in, in person. I do that whenever we launch a fund. Okay, that's wonderful. So that's www.parkavenuepartners.com. And then you have another URL for a different purpose, and that's mobilehomeparkinvestors.com. Tell us about yes. that. Yes. So that's me giving back. Uh, if you go there to mobilehomeparkinvestors.com, that will link you through to our uh, group on LinkedIn. It's the biggest of its kind. We are now just shy of 7,000 members. Uh, but that's a community where we give before we take. So people uh, are, are posting questions. People are posting answers. Generally, this is all related to how to find and how to operate a mobile home park. Um, so that's that links there. Uh, that also that what URL will also take you to my LinkedIn profile. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and then that URL also links through to our calendar. Uh, I keep the industry's calendar of events. So you could just download that right into your phone or look at it online and uh, learn about upcoming uh, mobile home park trade shows and other industry events. That's wonderful. Well, I tell you, this has been such an interesting interview to have you on, Jefferson. I appreciate you sharing. And uh, final comments before we sign off. Uh, just great to be with you. Uh, I'd encourage folks that are considering getting into whatever the niche of real estate is. Uh, you know, you, you, you've got to jump in. You got to actually do it at some point. Certainly go to some trade shows, learn what you can, read some books, find a mentor. Uh, but then you got to just pull the trigger and, and get into it, start doing it, stop studying it and, and actually get in. So I should have done that uh, sooner. I just encourage folks to get educated but then actually pull the trigger, get into whatever niche of real estate you're looking at and uh, your, your learning and uh, your net worth uh, should both accelerate once you're uh, in the game. Great advice, Jefferson. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jay. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. So glad you decided to join us. Be sure if you're watching on YouTube to ring that bell and to subscribe so you don't miss out on any more of the upcoming amazing episodes. If you're on uh, iTunes, be sure and follow us. And we look forward to seeing you right here on the very next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner. Oh